When it comes to religion, most of us in the West are probably fairly familiar with the basics of the Abrahamic faiths. Christianity, of course, Islam, and Judaism. Understandably so, as aside from most of us here in the West having been brought up in or around at least one of these traditions, just over half of the entire world population belongs to either of those first two, Christianity and Islam. Christianity in some form or another is the dominant faith in the continents of North America, South America, Australia, and Europe, not to mention across nearly the entirety of Sub-Saharan Africa, while Islam constitutes a leading faith across Northern Africa, and seeing the Muslim population dominating across all of West and Central Asia, not to mention the vast majority of Indonesia. In total, Christians of all branches and denominations constitute approximately 31% of the global population at about 2.4 billion, while Muslims of all backgrounds make up about 25% of the world population with 1.9 billion followers. We of course know that Hinduism is the dominant faith across most of the Indian subcontinent with about 1.2 billion religious adherents for Hinduism worldwide, or about 15% of the world population. But then there's East Asia. With 29% of the global population remaining, a good chunk of which belongs exclusively to this region of the world, some of us are left wondering what religion or religions are such a large fraction of the world population practicing that we don't really talk about. Countries like China, Vietnam, Korea, and Japan who collectively make up over 20% of the global population, are they Christian, or Atheist, or Buddhist, or Confucius? The answer is more complicated than it might seem. Hello audience, Mr. Z here with another video for you. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We have videos like this every week, so be sure to subscribe and stay tuned. In the beginning, there was Japan. And now there's today's sponsor, Tokyo Treat. Folks, you're going to want to stick around for the whole ad, because this video isn't just going to teach you something new about Asia, but our sponsors are giving you an opportunity to experience an exotic taste of Japan in the form of a monthly subscription box. Every single box comes loaded with up to 20 limited edition and seasonal Japanese snacks, from drinks to candy to ramen. The folks over at Tokyo Treat were kind enough to send me a box to sample for myself, and I happened to be hanging out with my buddy Josh Sullivan History when we unboxed it. Oh, hold on, what's this? Oh, we got some anime right there. As soon as I opened the box, I was hit with this very pleasant sweet smell. I don't know what they're doing over in Japan, but we need to start doing that over here. <sighs> Put your nose in there, Josh. Oh, it does smell nice. I enjoyed literally everything here. My favorite thing was probably these little truffle chocolates and the Sakura Corinto, which, if I can make a comparison, were almost like sweet honey pretzels, but with that distinct Sakura flavor. There were also these little curry puffs, which almost tasted like if popcorn was made out of a bowl of ramen. Honestly, I'd sponsor these guys again next month if it meant I got another box. This was seriously really cool. Now, every box has a seasonal theme, and this box, as you might have guessed from some of the items, is themed after Yozakura, Japan's famous cherry blossoms illuminated at night. Right now, you can get your own Tokyo Treat box with $5 off your final order when you follow the link below and use promo code MrZ at checkout. Now, back to the video. Official statistics will often claim that the majority of East Asia is utterly irreligious or atheist. However, this classification is in reality a misunderstanding of the relationship between East Asian populations and their religious beliefs. In the Abrahamic world, there is a strong identification of the individual with their faith. It is something that contributes significantly to personal identity. It is an authority in and of itself unto the lives of its followers. In the Christian world, it is said that one belongs to a church. In Islam, it is said that one submits themselves to God. But in the East Asian world, religion, at least local religion, is a practice, but not something which a person belongs or submits to. And as a result, many within East Asian countries don't claim to belong to a particular faith, but the vast majority do in fact practice. Practice. Let's begin with Japan. The historic faith of the Japanese has been and remains Kami no Michi, or more colloquially, Shinto. Kami no Michi roughly translates to something along the lines of the way of the sacred spirits, and the sacred spirits, or Kami, exist as part of the natural world and must be respected and venerated to preserve a natural balance and bring oneself in closer alignment with nature. There are three main types of kami, the heavenly deities, the earthly spirits, and the countless spirits. Naturally, this creates something of a religious pantheon within Shinto, though not an exclusive one, as humans of righteous character and adherence to Shinto can themselves become kami, and the emperor of Japan himself is regarded as a descendant of the sacred spirit of the sun, giving the imperial title spiritual significance within Shinto, though the emperor's status within Shinto was forcibly diminished through legal restriction by the United States after World War II. Practitioners of Shinto are expected to undergo a process of self-purification to better understand the divine nature of the world, and do so by upholding the four affirmations, that being defending the family and tradition, developing a love of nature, maintaining health and cleanliness, and revering the spirits. 
Shinto is practiced by about 80% of the Japanese population, but unlike the Abrahamic faiths, being a practitioner of Shinto does not exclude one from practicing other religions, so long as it does not conflict with the tenets of Shinto, and this is where we encounter Japan's second largest religion, Buddhism. Buddhism was introduced to Japan from the Asian mainland and quickly took off despite initial tensions between Buddhist and Shinto practitioners. Eventually it was felt that Buddhism and Shinto could complement one another in a unique synergy, seeing Shintoism assimilate Buddhism and produce an amalgamation of the two in many parts of Japan. This, however, was undone during the Meiji Restoration when the Japanese sought to strengthen their traditions against foreign influence and separated Buddhist influence from Shintoism, refining the latter into what the US would later call State Shinto. Today, about 60% of Japan's population practices Buddhism or aspects of Buddhism amalgamated with Shinto. Approximately 1.5% of the Japanese population also identifies as Christian, however it is believed by some that much like with Buddhism, some Shinto practitioners have adopted aspects of Christian practice into their own traditions as well. Now, South Korea is an interesting example of Christianity's success in East Asia, with Christians as a whole forming the single largest organized religious group within South Korea at about 30% of the population, and Buddhists right behind at about 20%, with the two being somewhat rivalrous and sometimes clashing. Unlike Japan, however, the classification of religious and non-religious in South Korea is a bit more on point. Officially, about 60% of South Korea's population is non-religious, and 20% explicitly identify as atheist. While Korea has had a historic folk religion somewhat similar to Shinto called Muism, it has failed to maintain prominence in the modern day, having been repeatedly suppressed throughout history, and is now largely only practiced within rural lower-income communities, though this being said, the influence of the faith is still present across the rest of South Korea's religious landscape, even among Christian communities. Now this being said, with atheists being taken into account, we still have an approximate 40% of Korea's population which is unaffiliated with any other religious group, and while we can assume that at least some of them practice Buddhism without identifying as members of any Buddhist order, there is another culprit likely contributing to South Korea's secular nature. Confucianist values and rituals continue to be central parts of Korean life. Family structures, laws, and habits in South Korea still largely owe their origins to Confucian roots, but this too seems to be diminishing generation after generation. Still, it might be expected that much of the unaffiliated population still practices some degree of Confucianism, even if purely out of habit. However, it must also be emphasized that while some do regard Confucianism as a religion, and we are doing so for the sake of this video given its influence on Far Eastern thought, Confucianist thought is essentially secular, lacking the same spiritualism of other East Asian faiths. In many ways, while Japan succeeded in assimilating foreign religions and maintaining its own religious traditions, Korea has always been something of a melting pot of religion and philosophy, be it Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, Yuism, or Christianity, but failed to maintain its spiritual traditions along the way, leaving it to be a fairly secular yet religiously divided country today. In contrast, its northern neighbor of North Korea, although officially an atheist state, has maintained a high degree of old Korean religious beliefs, with practitioners of Muism and its offshoot of Chendoism supposedly comprising approximately 40% of North Korea's total population. Chendoism has even gained support from the North Korean government given its firm opposition to foreign influences including Buddhism and Christianity and its emphasis on North Korean exceptionalism. The specifics of the situation in North Korea are a bit difficult to confirm given how closed off the country has remained. The situation in China is similarly hazy, but fortunately not as much as it is in the case of North Korea. The People's Republic of China is officially an atheist state as well, however national surveys seem to suggest that much like Japan, close to 80% of the Chinese population practices a form of indigenous ancient Chinese spirit or ancestor worship, colloquially referred to as Shen Dao. If it wasn't clear before, there is a seeming commonality to Japanese Shinto, Korean Chendo, and Chinese Shen Dao. And while the names may sound similar and their basis is rooted in a mutual reverence of spirits and ancestors, the three are distinctly separate in that they each recognize themselves as domestic religions, much in the same way an ancient Greek would acknowledge the gods of the Persians or the gods of the Egyptians, but only revere those of Greece. Even if there was some commonality between just for example the sun god Helios, Ra, and Mithra, they would each belong to a native pantheon of different people. The Chinese infamously attempted to do away with the four olds, old customs, old culture, old ideas, old habits, and this included a significant degree of religious suppression and persecution, but this hadn't been the first time China needed to endure such a thing, and by the late 1970s, China began changing its approach, enshrining freedom of religion into their constitution and embarking on a restoration effort of several religious and cultural sites and artifacts. 
This came with the exception of newly emerging cults which were swiftly suppressed and would see Protestantism, Catholicism, Buddhism, Taoism, and Islam tolerated to varying degrees, but only under a newly established state-run apparatus, effectively creating new Chinese sects of these faiths. While antagonism against foreign religions would increase over time, attitudes toward Taoism and Buddhism would later improve, with the CCP officially recognizing them as integral facets of Chinese culture, which, along with Confucianism, constitute what are known as the Three Teachings. Though this being said, Shen Dao is still and even increasingly upheld by the CCP as the religion of the Chinese people, with the CCP in recent years seeking to bring about a revival of Chinese traditionalism through the promotion of Shen Dao practices. Despite Chinese positions on Buddhism having improved since the end of the Cultural Revolution and anywhere from 20 to 35% of the Chinese population practicing Buddhism, Tibet has remained something of an exception facing pressure from the Chinese government given not only its distinct strain of Buddhist practice, but also its historic ambitions of achieving independence. Secessionist ambitions have also contributed to the Chinese assuming a particularly hostile position against the Islamic Uyghur population. An observation of another Islamic Chinese population highlights this as the Hui, who are also largely Islamic and almost just as numerous as the Uyghurs, experience significantly more tolerance and freedom than the Uyghurs do, and this along with a tumultuous history has led to increased rivalry between the Hui and the Uyghur populations. In Taiwan, we also find adherence to Chinese-style Shen Daoism, albeit in a form more closely amalgamated with Taoism. Buddhism also has a more noteworthy presence on Taiwan than on the mainland, with many Buddhists having fled from the mainland to Taiwan during the Cultural Revolution. Another group that has found a home on Taiwan in the face of persecution from the mainland are a number of small New Age cults. Vietnam, like the other countries we've covered, are generally regarded to be highly irreligious, but once again sees a large majority of its population adhere to a local folk religion, though in the case of Vietnam there appears to be a greater variety of practices and interpretations of spiritual hierarchy across the country, not being quite as uniform as in the cases of China or Japan. Yet the influences of Chinese Shen Dao, Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism are clear enough to see. The Vietnamese folk religion known as Dao Long, or just Dao, not to be confused with Taoism, is largely animistic and polytheistic with two main branches, a traditional branch and a maternal branch, the latter of which emphasizes the worship of a mother goddess and lower goddesses. Across the remainder of Southeast Asia, religion is much more clear-cut, with these countries overwhelmingly belonging to the oldest known school of Buddhism, Theravada, and it is distinct from that which is predominantly practiced across virtually the entirety of the remaining Buddhist world. Unlike the form of Buddhism primarily practiced within China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Vietnam, the Theravada Buddhism of Southeast Asia is more exclusive, conservative, and oriented toward the achievement of personal enlightenment, making it somewhat less collectivist and selfless than its counterparts. Beyond this, while still very spiritualistic, Theravada does not hold the Buddha to the same spiritual heights other schools might, seeing the Buddha more as a guide and role model than a transcendent being. Finally, we have Mongolia, who, to probably none of our surprise, also features prominently its own folk religion akin to those of its neighbors, though of course one more heavily influenced by and intermingled with Tibetan-style Mantrayana Buddhism, a school of Buddhism which emphasizes ritual, extensive meditation, deity worship, and accelerating the path to personal enlightenment through a guru-student relationship. Though unlike Japan or China, Buddhism has risen to surpass local Mongolian folk religion and influence, having largely assimilated it rather than the other way around. Mongolia's folk religion, known colloquially as Tengrism, emphasizes ancestral and spiritual worship, though does hold a supreme deity, a sky father, above all other Tengr, the Mongolian equivalent to Japan's heavenly deities. There does exist something of a schism within Tengrism among those who have largely embraced Buddhist practices and beliefs alongside Tengrism, and those who are more purist and seek to maintain old Tengrist traditions, though this being said, it's clear that Buddhism, whether on its own or intermingled with Tengrism, holds a far more influential role in Mongolian society than Tengrism alone. And there we have it, the religions of East Asia explained. Let us know what you think in the comments below, like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more. Mr. Z, out.